All righty, good, good, good. All right, was there anyone else in particular who wanted to share a testimony? All right, well, then we'll get on with the team. This shouldn't be scary at all. All right, never anything scary about giving a talk about relationships in marriage. All right, we'll just check we've got the right microphone going. Good, good, good. All right, so this, this talk on relationships and marriage, the first talks about relationships, which of course builds the foundation for marriage. Um, so we're going to go through this. Um, it took me a little while to put this together, so I hope it's okay. And it's going to start with a disclaimer. All right, <laughs> so this presentation presents a model of um, healthiness, it's not a fix for all problems. For example, in the same way that a presentation on good dietary advice is you know, to solve a broken leg. So if you have a problem, you should get help and probably from a specialist in relationships, which is not me, I'm not a guru. So I benefit from following this presentation as much as anyone else. So, so there you go. Um, all right, so let's start with uh, 3 John chapter 1, verse 2, which says, The beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers, which indicates that God wants us to have healthy lives. All right? And in the same way, he says uh, in Matthew, uh, the eye of the lamp is the body. So if your eye is clear or spiritually perceptive, uh, you should, your whole body will be full of light benefiting from God's precepts. This is from the Amplified Version. So part of having a healthy life is having a healthy perception and God's precepts are beneficial. Okay? In Psalm 119, it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So God's way, uh, word, should shape our perceptions and our actions. All right, so what we get into here, if we go then to Second Peter chapter one and verses nineteen and twenty, we also uh, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shines in a dark place, knowing this first that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. God's word contains the precepts and the directions He wants us to follow. So if we put all of that together. God wants us to have healthy lives spiritually, physically, socially, mentally, and emotionally. Uh, these elements are all interrelated. Healthy ways of understanding and perceiving are vital to healthy lives. God's word is the foundation to a healthy perception, and health problems of any sort require specialist help. All right? That's how it goes. All right, so let's. Honing on relationships. So, what is a relationship? Well, according to the dictionary, a relationship is the state of being related or interrelated, the way in which people or things are related, or a close friendship or love affair. Ooh, that bad. So, if we think about relationships, it's the connections between people. And there are many different kinds of connections between people. We have uh, social relationships with friends and workmates. We have emotional, uh, very emotional, close to us relationships with family, friends. We have real financial relationships, connections with people, work, and so on and such forth. And we have these connections on a wide variety of levels. Uh, you know, the relationships you have with people at home is very different from the relationships you have with people at work, school, university, in the community. The, the person at the supermarket you say hello to and get to know on a first name basis because they have a badge and you see them regularly, whatever it is. We have different levels of relationship. They're all forms of connection between people. So if we have a look at Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and I will sup with him and he with me. So the Lord wants to have a relationship with us. He wants to have a connection with us. And God's way of having a relationship with us 
is a good and healthy relationship. So God's relationship with us, his connection to us, is a good model for our relationship with other people, if we can. So the keys to this, um, the relationships and the connections between people and people and things, relationships are incredibly varied. What is appropriate for one relationship isn't necessarily appropriate for another. As a perfect example, the way Hannah is slumped on her mother there would not be appropriate if she was on a bus. Okay, it's sitting next to just some brain. Okay. God, however, God's connection to his people is a good model for all of the different kinds of relationships from the most, the closest relationships right to the, you know, the, the, the person at the supermarket. Therefore, the foundation for good relationships can be found in God's word. So what are the foundations for relationships? Woo. I hate for you to miss out on that one. It has three important words. So Romans chapter 12 and verse 10, be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love in honour, preferring one another. So God indicates that love is a key part of good relationships. Okay? 1 Corinthians 13 says that love is patient, uh, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. So love is about how we treat people, and according to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it's pretty practical rather than being some abstract wishy-washy kind of thing. So lust is all about having and consuming. But love is all about caring and giving. All right. So, according to the dictionary, there it is. Uh, love is a strong feeling of attachment or tenderness and protectiveness for another person. It's a warm interest in and enjoyment of someone. And in First John chapter four, it says, "Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loves." Is born of God and knows God, and he that loves not knows not God, for God is love, which is quite a strong statement that he who loves not knows not God. It is impossible to really have a relationship with God unless you take on love. Love is a part of God's character. And of course, it goes on to say, We love him because he first loved us. So God is the model. Sorry. God is the model and the source of our love. John 3, 16, we know this so well. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believe in, believes in him should not uh, perish, but have eternal life. God's love is shown by what he's done and what he does for us. God's love isn't just this weird abstract thing where he's off in heaven, kind of loving us like... <laughs> And we all just radiate when we see he does things for us. That's how he shows his love. All right. Um, you know, and this is, I think we might have this verse later, so I won't refer to it now. Uh, 1 John chapter 3 Dear children, let us not love in words or tongue, but in actions and in truth. So our love also is meant to be acting for other people. And in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, but speaking with truth and love, we uh, may grow up in him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compact by that which every joint supplies. And this is the key thing. Everyone involved in a relationship needs to activate love, love or care. All right? So the first foundation for relationships is love and care. Okay? It's active, not passive. It's, in fact, defined by action. Okay, think about Jesus. Greater love has no man than this that he laid down his life for his friends. Okay, not that he thinks about it and he's prepared to do it, but never actually does. Okay, it's defined by the action. And it's all about giving and caring. Now, in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13, it says, Now all has been heard of here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Hmm. It is right to have a deep respect for God. All right? Um, and once again, in John chapter 14, if you love me, keep my commandments, 
So respect itself is also active and it's related and linked to love. All right, now respect is a special or high regard, esteem, polite regard or deference, um, expressions of respect or politeness. And so our second foundation to relationships is respect. And there is a respect that is given and there is a respect that is earned. But we are focused more on the respect that is given. There is a, a myth amongst certain groups of people today that you don't get give respect unless it's earned. Because what if the person isn't worthy of respect? But you see, you can give respect, you can treat someone with, someone with respect, even if they're not respectable. All right, it says something about you. Um, if we can show respect to people who haven't earned it, and like love, the measure of our character is in how we treat other people, not in how people treat us. So, godliness, use there, uh, means pious or well reverent. Another way of describing it would be loving respect. God exemplifies this approach in action. God calls us to exemplify this approach to Him and to each other, love and respect combined. And interestingly, you can go to First Timothy chapter six verse six. It says, "But godliness, use of there, loving respect with contentment, is great gain." So combining godliness, love, respect with appreciation is highly beneficial. And so our third foundation for healthy relationships is appreciation. Okay, once again, once again, appreciation should be given rather than demanded. Okay, it, it, appreciation is intrinsically positive. You can't appreciate something negatively <laughs> unless you're actually not really appreciating it. Okay, it's hard to appreciate what you don't love and respect. So contentment builds on godliness. Okay, Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee from loving with loving kindness, and tender mercies, who satisfies satisfies thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like eagles. And so a relationship with God involves forgiveness. Okay? Come, let us read together, though you sins be scarlet, though be white as snow. It's impossible for us to have a relationship with God without forgiveness. Right? It's, it's just a, a key thing. Uh, in Matthew chapter 6, we read, Pray then in this way, as a model or pattern, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed, set apart, keep and treat us holy or revered, this is the Amplified, uh, be your name, your kingdom come, a plea for God's kingdom to be inaugurated on earth, your will be done on heaven, earth as it is in heaven, including what God wishes to be done by the individual believer, his commands and precepts. Give us this day our daily bread, life's essential, and forgive us our debts, sins, moral failures, as we have forgiven our debtors, letting go of both the wrong and the resentment. And we need to reflect God's forgiveness. It's important to note that often um, the, the simple ways we tend to uh, train children don't accurately reflect things. Because one of the myths I've seen is um, that's a simple way of teaching children to forgive is to forgive and forget. All right? And, and, and I don't believe that's true. Okay? I don't necessarily think that forgiveness automatically requires um, forgetting as if, as if the thing had happened. And I'll give you an example. If, a, if someone comes to my house with a small child and that small child bump something over onto the ground, okay? Um, if I'm going to forgive that child, they're a small child, that they do stuff like that. I'm not going to forget that they did it and put it back where they're going to bump it onto the ground again. Okay, I'm going to lift it up and put it on the top of the bench so that that small child uh, isn't going to cause that problem again. 
So forgiveness doesn't automatically mean forgetting. All right. Sometimes forgiveness means we, we do something to avoid that problem again. All right. Um, there was just uh, oh, there was just recently uh, uh, looking at the media uh, that terrible accident up in New South Wales. Okay, where someone went driving uh, with five kids, you know, school kids in their their vehicle lost control. I don't know. I don't know the details of the accident. They haven't really spoken about it, but five school kids have died. And the father of one of the kids who died went to the media to say, I don't hold a grudge against the young guy who was driving. He's he's a kid himself. All right, this is an accident. I don't want to blame, I just want to get on the grieving for my child. That doesn't mean he's going to tell his other children, go and hop in the car with an experienced driver to a who are booting around a little bit. He's going to learn from that, that, but still be able to forgive that person, which is a good thing. Forgiveness can come and go as well. You can forgive someone and then something can happen later on that just brings back perhaps the hurt that they caused and you have to work through it again. These things happen. But of course, the Lord can always help us. Mark chapter 11. Uh, when you stand praying to forgive, if you have ought against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive your trespasses. And that is a scary verse to me. That's always terrified me because I want to be forgiven. Okay, so I've got to, I've got to forgive people. Okay, so a failure to forgive interferes with our relationship with God. So our four foundations forgiveness. Once again, forgiveness should be given a gift rather than demanded. Uh, there should be another word in there before that will stop. But there you go. Sometimes there is. Lack of forgiveness will hurt you as much as eat or even more than the person you are not forgiving. And I really want to kind of get this in your head. Forgiveness does not mean you pretend it never happened and set yourself up to be hurt again. All right? That's, we're not saying that. Right? Forgiveness is something deeper and richer than that, but it's a gift that you give, even though you might move on from that person because they haven't changed. There's that potential. This means that forgiveness is a weight or a burden that you let go of. And forgiveness is not weakness. When Jesus was on the cross, what they what was, I find one of his most inspiring things that he said was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And that is that was an act of remarkable strength, not of weakness. So we've got our four um, foundations for relationships. Okay, godliness, which is love and respect, contentment and forgiveness. And each one of those, okay, if you think about it, in, in practice, we have a wide variety of people we have relationships with, and we're going to show those uh, things at different levels. Okay, the love and care that I give to the stranger who's just tripped over on the street is very different from the love and care I give to my children. And that there's a that part of that love, I guess, love and care is the physical intimacy that comes in with particularly personal relationships. All right, but there we go. We've got care, respectful behavior, appreciation, and acceptance and letting go of hurts. So the four foundations, we go them through them, they apply to all relationships at appropriate levels. All right. If you can't judge what the appropriate level is, seek specialist help. That's all I can say. Um, they are defined by actions. Uh, they're not just what you feel, but they're what you're showing. So the key to these foundations is what you show people. Okay, so let's talk about showing relationships. Because Jesus and the, and the Lord God didn't just feel these things, he showed them, as we've spoken before. In Matthew chapter 22, it says, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God. Okay, and he didn't stop there. But again, talk about how you show that love with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. 
So God wants us to love him in our heart, emotionally, with our soul, our personality, and with our mind, cognitively. And if we have a look at Mark chapter 12, it's, it's the same thing again, but similar. There's a bit more. Mark chapter 12, verse 30. If thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. So God also wants us to love him with our bodies, physically, through our actions, what we do. Now, of course, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in the spirit and truth. It says that in John chapter 4. So God operates on the spiritual plane. So, so physical intimacy is not a need he has. Okay? We don't give God a cuddle when he's feeling down. Okay? Physical intimacy is a need of physical beings. All right? So in Matthew chapter 25, the king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. So we can show our love for God in this physical world through our relationships with the people around about us. Okay, because that's what that parable is talking about. I'll tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of these, you did for me. John chapter uh, 1, John chapter 4, uh, verses 18 and 21. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear has torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. And if, if a man say, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. And he's quite possibly lying to himself. You're fooling no one but yourself. You hate people that claim to love God. You're in a delusional world. Okay? For he that loves not his brother whom he can see or who he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment hath we from him that he who loves God loves his brother also. Now that can be tricky because God's less annoying than many of our brothers and sisters in the world. Okay, if you've come to a meeting and someone sat in your seat or parked in your car park, or or they, you know, sat there sniffling in your ear, or I don't know what they've done, they've stepped on your toe or sneezed on your mind, or whatever it is. And you know, God doesn't do that kind of annoying stuff. <coughs> so therefore, forgiveness is a huge part of what we do here. Okay. So our relationship, uh, ooh, yes, our relationship with God is a model of our relationships. Our relationship with others is almost a measure of our relationship with God. That's a challenging statement. Remember the words of uh, this is Acts chapter twenty. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how He said, "It's more blessed to give than to receive." And once again, giving in a relationship is more important than receiving. Second Corinthians chapter nine. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, but God loves a cheerful giver. So the giving in a relationship should be done willingly and happily, not grudgingly or mournfully. Everyone loves to be around someone who kind of makes it absolutely, totally clear what a chore it is for them to be doing whatever it is they're doing with you. <laughs> Nothing makes you feel like perhaps murdering someone more okay so showing relationships we've got four ways we've got the heart emotionally how we feel about people and we should feel positively about people okay soul personality what are we like as a person do we behave well or are we obnoxious and rude uh, mind cognitively how do we think about people remember we read in first Corinthians chapter 13 then before thinks no evil okay we don't hold grudges we don't know if there's no evil Okay, we think well of people. Okay, and body physically, how do we act we, uh, and what we do for people? We treat people well. So, as it says in Luke chapter 6, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good. And we cannot expect to think badly and feel badly about people and not have it end up showing. There's actually a whole, if you think about it, um, Jesus said that it's not, uh, what is it? What we perceive has an effect on us. It's what's inside of us that is a measure of our character. And also he talked about it's what comes out of a person that defiles them. And if we if we look at people 
and we have a negative perspective about them or think wrong thoughts, at some point we'll say something, we'll trip up and let the truth be known, which is we have a bad opinion of them, we're holding the growth. Okay, you're not going to be able to hold that forever. And I'll tell you what, if, if, if kids aren't keen on teachers, the teachers they hate the most are the ones who are pretending to like them because they snip it out and they know, which is I don't even pretend to like them. Okay, <laughs> Luke chapter 23. Uh, then said Jesus, Father, given that they know what they do, Jesus showed them care, even though he didn't agree with all their actions and these key things. Just because we or just because we are showing all of the the elements of a healthy relation doesn't mean that we are agreeing with the person. We're not a sap, we're not dormant. Okay? He didn't necessarily like them. I believe you can love someone that you don't like. Okay? If love is the way you treat people and it's very practical, I can treat people lovingly, even though their actions and the way they behave. Is is unpleasant and and not what I approve of. All right, this is not just an, a, a blank check for us to embrace everything that's going on around about us. Like much of religion has, where you know I'm going to love everyone, so therefore everybody can do anything, and I'll forgive them for anything and everything. No, not all things are acceptable. Okay, um, Jesus showed or gave rather than took, received, or demanded. So one of the keys we should show our love and care, respect, appreciation, and forgiveness. We should show it through how we feel about people, what we're like as a person, how we think, and how we act. And these things are interdependent. If you lack in one, it will end up showing in others. So showing is all about giving rather than receiving. And so I'd like to share a metaphor with you, or with you the bridge metaphor of relationships. So in Genesis chapter 28, uh, this is Joseph. Uh, jo uh, we've got Joseph here. Uh, no, not Joseph. The other one. Isaac. Jacob. Is it, I knew it was a J one. Okay, he, he was sleeping there with his head on a pillow or a rock, which he had for a pillow. Had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on its earth and his top reaching to heaven, and the angel of, uh, angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And also, um, uh, later in the start of um, John, I think it was Philemon, one of the disciples came to him, and Jesus said, he, he added, I tell you the truth that you shall see heaven open, and the angels of God and ascending and descending on the Son of Man. The Son of Man is going to bridge the gap between people and, and the heavenly kingdom, which he did by laying down his life. So this concept of a ladder or spanning a gap uh, is a metaphor for relationship words and it's similar to the concept of the bridge so I feel like I didn't always have another end. So it's all good. So if we have a little bridge, I think this is cool the bridge. So humans have been using arches in architecture since the first uh, second millennium BC. And this is very, very kind of stereotypical art. And so let's have a look at the components of a simple arch bridge. Okay. We have the substance of the bridge on one side. That's just kind of filled in there with whatever it is that you want on one side of the bridge. Okay, we then have the substance of the other side of the bridge. Okay, Shakara, who, who saw that coming. In between there, you have the keystone of the arch. And you'll notice that that kind of section is a little bit bigger. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a real thing. Keystone right in the center. If that stays up, the bridge stays up. This keystone section there. If it falls down, the bridge has collapsed. All right. So that's why that's referred to as the keystone, the key to it all. Okay. You then have the foundations. And you'll notice the foundations down the bottom here. You can see how it's kind of structured differently. The foundations don't hold up the keystone. And yet they do. The foundations, all of the, uh, I guess you could say, the force from the foundations is passed through the actual arch. And you can do all of the physics about this, draw lots of little arrows about where the force is going and how this is wider and skinnier so it can't fall down, whatever. But essentially, the foundation is holding it up and it's it's been uh, 
a, a pass through the arch into the keystone from both directions. All right, one side cannot hold up the keystone by itself. Right, you can't take away this half of the bridge and have the keystone just kind of hang there. Both sides are required. So that is the bridge metaphor. And if we're going to relay the things, that's person one. Okay, and that's person two. Right, and this, the keystone, is the relationship between them. Okay, if that drops down, the relationship is not working. Right, so to do that, we need to have the foundations to hold up, to provide the, the base for all of the, the heavy lifting for this relationship. But that needs to be passed through or shown. Right, those foundations need to be activated in the arc way. So, the more intense and the more important the relationship, the stronger the foundation, and the stronger how it is how the how it is activated through the arc way, and it needs to be the stronger it needs to be shown. All right. So, if you think about that, that's all of the elements we've been talking about. That um, in the arc way, the foundations love care, um, respect, appreciation, and forgiveness, both sides need them, okay? And both sides need to show it in what they do, how they think, how they feel, okay? And the way they behave. And if either side stops doing that, they either stop showing their love, care, um, respect, appreciation, and uh, forgiveness, or maybe they still have it, but they don't, have it. Or, or maybe they don't even have those things anymore. They just no longer love, care, or respect, or whatever the other person. Then the relationship will fall down. And it doesn't matter how much the other side is showing their love, their care, their respect, their forgiveness, their appreciation. They can't hold the relationship up all by themselves. And the stronger they try and hold that relationship up that's collapsing, the more they might end up in a world of pain because you just can't do it. Relationships need both sides to be activated for them to be successful and healthy. And we have many, many models around the world of unhealthy relationships. Now, uh, Joan Bayer said, the easiest relationship is with 10,000 people, the hardest is with one. Because the stronger the relationship, the more these things need to be activated and get them shown. So a relationship requires two people to hold it up. And the foundations, love, care, respect, appreciation, forgiveness are needed. And unless the foundations are shown in how we feel, how we, how we pay, uh, what we think and how we act and treat people, the relationship will collapse. If we just hide our love and respect and everything away and never actually show it, the other person, it's, it's not going to work. All components need to be activated for the relationship to work. Okay. So in conclusion, and we're going to go through all these points again. Relationships are the connections between people. God's people are marked by their relationships. It is a part of our testimony. And I would suggest to you that even our failed relationships are a part of our testimony. And that, that we would like it, that even if the relationship has collapsed, it's not because we didn't hold up our end. We did what we could but the relationship failed because maybe it was just us holding it up. Relationships vary greatly. They're founded on love, care, respect, appreciation, forgiveness. They're shown by how we feel, what we like, how we think about people, and how we act and treat people. Uh, relationships require both people to be active in the relationship. One person's commitment, foundation, and behavior is no guarantee of a successful relationship, and another person's lack of commitment, foundational poor behavior is 
it is no excuse for similar behavior in return. All right, the measure of our character is not in how we, uh, how people treat us, but in how we treat people. So, actions. First one, consider the relationships you currently have at home, work, school, church, supermarket, whatever. Are you being active in these relationships or are you cruising on other people's effort? And so, the action is activate yourself in your relationships. Bring your love, your or your care, probably more care in most of our relationships, our care, respect, appreciation, forgiveness to bear, and start showing them. Okay? Also, consider the priority you place on the relationships that you currently have. Are they operating at the appropriate level and priority? For example, do you treat your mates better than your partner or your children. Okay, it's important that we put effort into our relationships proportional to their real importance. Jesus said the first commandment, of course, was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and soul, and strength. And second, or underneath that, is to love your neighbor as yourself. He wasn't, you know, love your neighbor as yourself if your neighbor is really lovable, and then maybe love God if you feel like it. There was a hierarchy. And so it is with our relationships. And we should sit down and go, okay, who think the people in my life, am I giving proportionally the things that they should I should be giving to them proportional to the relationship I'm supposed to have with them? Okay? Consider what your relationships are founded on. Have you actively thought about and built up your love, care, respect, appreciation, and forgiveness? Have you let these foundations potentially be eroded by complacency, negativity, or a misguided attitude that the other person should provide these for you and or earn them? Okay? Rebuild your own love, care, respect, appreciation, acceptance, and forgiveness. Okay? I was very mindful of the fact that there was a uh, there's a lady in the Memorial Assembly who she came along and the marriage was in. In a, in a bit of a mess. Uh, and a, a Pastor Mervyn early on spent a lot of time going up and talking to them about, about their relationship and, and everything like that. And um, she eventually came to the conclusion I just don't love my husband anymore. And so she went up to the prayer line and said, and asked, had put in a prayer request, and she didn't really tell the person what she was praying for. But what she was praying for was, I need to love my husband like I did when I first married him. And then next thing you know, she woke up and she was all giddy with love and I was sick of it. It was just sick of it. Okay? The foundation of being eroded away by time events, uh, arguments, mistreatment, whatever the case may be, they need to get back to the foundation. Right? Okay? As much as possible. The next thing is, of course, how do you show your love, care, respect, appreciation, and forgiveness. Is the other person meant to assume that they exist? When did, when did you last make the person feel cared for or respected or appreciated or accepted or forgiven? And are you more worried about the love, care, respect, appreciation, and forgiveness you receive rather than what you give? And we need to, in our relationships, make the other person feel the care, respect, um, appreciation and uh, forgiveness that we have for them. Okay. Once again, if you don't have that, you've got to you've got to sort that out. But once you've got it, you need to show it. You need to show these things. This is what holds the relationship up. And if it isn't, that's what lets the relationship fall. All right. And that definitely lays the foundation for the marriage fall. And I think most of you could see how it does in a lot of ways. So that's the end of that.